If you would, find a copy of your worship guide and find the area where you can take notes and be a part of uh, the sermon outline. It is uh, kind of a different type of presentation this morning because the text is lengthy, uh, but we will try to be mindful of our time and of the importance of the message. And I would encourage you to find John's Gospel, chapter 9, and uh, then join me, if you would, in a word of prayer. Father, this morning, I ask that you bless this passage of Scripture as we hear from your word. Lord, that we might become a part of it, and we might see the dynamics that go on between Jesus and the crowd and the disciples and the blind man and the religious orthodoxy of the day. And Father, the lessons you want us to learn is you take us from where we are to where you want us to be. Keep us mindful always that you are indeed the light of the world. And if we will make that light a lamp unto our feet, it will be a guide for our path. And if we hide those things in our heart, Lord, we'll find that way not to sin and to flourish in eternal living. I pray and I ask this in the name of the Christ, Jesus our Lord. Amen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be, what? Light. Let there be light. Light is very significant. He took the chaos of darkness and by speaking brought through that light the world and the worlds into existence. Is there any wonder that John, who was such a student and insightful disciple, would begin his gospel the same way in the beginning? It sounds just like Genesis was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. All things were what? Created by him, and without him was not anything made that was made, and in him was what? Life, and that life was the light of all men. And the light, once you have that light in you, and I have that light in me, it shines in the darkness, and the darkness literally from the text cannot snuff it out. It's important that we understand and that we possess Jesus, who is the light of the world. This morning we read in verse 1, it says, As he went along... He saw a man blind from birth. Now we're going to learn a number of things about this man. This story is going to be both humorous and serious. It's filled with narrative and interaction. And so I want you to walk with me through the story, and then we'll come back and take your outline and go through that. Uh, I do know that the outline is already there. Uh, Gene, you, are you headed out of here? Okay, we just got a problem. I was going hoping it was up here. The eye of an eagle, I am the light of the world. Man, when the guy running your prompter walks out, your heart goes... <laughs> uh, but uh, we'll, we'll put those words up as we go along. But I want you to walk through the narrative with me and let's see what we can learn about this man that Jesus meets along the way. You know, he's on his way to Jerusalem eventually to suffer and die. And he's made that major turn in his ministry. He's past the halfway point. And his focus is to go there, be crucified, and rise again on the third day. But while he's making his way, it says he comes by a man who was born blind. Now, it was believed in the first century, and, and I think it's still somewhat believed 
by folks today that if there's a problem or an issue in your life, uh, some kind of a manifestation that you must have done something wrong to deserve that or your parents did something wrong that caused you to be like you are. And uh, they certainly believe that if a person had any kind of deformity, any kind of lacking of total uh, physical uh, mobility, sight, and everything else, that either they sin or their parents sin. In fact, that's the question that's going to be asked. They see a man born blind, and his disciples ask that question. Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, Jesus shows us right here what correct theology and biblical doctrine is about that type of thing. Uh, and I think it's very important that we know that. Jesus simply says, neither this man nor his parents sin. Uh, but... He says, this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in him. God did it to show his handiwork. Now, when we talk about a work, I want to back up just a little bit and bring you back up for those of you who may be visiting with us today. We're journeying through this gospel of John. It's connected by seven signs or miracles. From the word simeon, from which we eventually will get our English word sign, it means it points, and it points directly at the fact that Jesus is indeed the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. He is the Lord's Messiah, or in the Greek, he is the Christ. So that's where we're at when we begin and Jesus is trying to teach them this truth and he says this is going to be another sign that points to the reality that I am the Lord's Christ, the Lord's Messiah, the Deliverer. That's what he's saying. But this is done that it might be done to show the mighty display of God's work. As long as it is day... We must do the works of him who sent me. And night is coming when no one can work. He's speaking, of course, of Calvary and of his death. While I am in the world, there it is, I am the light of the world. This is referred to in theological circles as the ego I me saying, the I am sayings. Of course, it's related directly back to the words given to Moses when he's going to Egypt to deliver God's people from the hand of Pharaoh. And he has to have some authority. He has to have something to empower him to approach the most powerful man in the world of that day, Pharaoh. And he asked God, who am I going to tell Pharaoh? Who am I going to tell him who sent me? And you remember, he said, tell Pharaoh, I am sent you. And so when John uses this, he's teaching a major church doctrine. And that is that Jesus is divine. He is God. He is the great I am. In fact, seven times in this book, he will refer to Jesus as the I am. If you want to know those seven, just look in the foyer when you go out. They're all up there. I encourage you to take those in. Look them up in the text. That's our next series. Don't want to spend a lot of time on that today. But today we're looking at the fact that he is the light of the world. This is one of those seven signs. Salvation comes by God's word. Salvation comes by faith. Salvation comes by grace. When you receive salvation, it brings peace. And then today it brings light, illumination. It gives us this peace, but it comes from the physical into the spiritual. And I want you to see this morning as we read and we go through the text how Jesus handles that. He says, I am the light of the world. And after saying this, he spit on the ground, he made some mud, and he put it on the man's eyes. And he says, go to the place called Sit, or to the pool of Siloam. And so he goes, and the man goes there, and he washes, and he came... Fourth what? Seeing. Uh, can you stand a little humor this morning? Okay, good. Have any of you ever asked the question, where do all the denominations come from? 
How many Baptists we got in here? How many Presbyterians? How about a Roman Catholic? Got a Roman Catholic? Got a Pentecostal? How about a Methodist? Ah, see, we, we have all these denominations. Well, I want you to know this is where it began. You see, Jesus healed a few folks that were blind. This one, he made mud, put it in his eye, said, go and wash. And he did. And he came forth what? Seeing. The next guy he heals, he reaches out and he touches his eyes and he can see. And these two guys meet up and they get into a argument over what is necessary to be healed from blindness. And the first two denominations were created. The Mudites and the Anti-Mudites. <laughs> hey, preacher humor gives you parameters. You can only do so much. But anyway, I thought that was pretty good. And, and the truth is really beyond even the laughter because most of what separates Christendom are particulars. What you think about the table, about how many times you should take communion, about how the service order ought to be. All these different little particulars separate us. And it's not Jesus' desire that we be separated. It's his desire that we be what? One. One. You know, he doesn't want Calvinists and Armenians. He wants Christians who know the Lord and live the Christian life and share the good news of the gospel while they do it. Yeah. And here's a person who's about to enter the ministry. He doesn't know it yet, but he's about to get there. And so God has just healed him. He comes forth seeing. And then when this happens, his neighbors, those who had formerly seen him begging, ask, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? And, of course, like all people, they can't what? Agree. Some of them said, yeah, that's him. Others said, no, that just looks like him. And they're arguing between themselves. But while they're doing this, he says, guys, guys, it is. It's me. That was me. I can see. How then were your eyes open, they ask. Now, it's interesting how many times he has to tell the story. He replied, the man they call Jesus made some mud. He put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and I washed and then I could see. Where is this man? I, I kind of believe he wants to say, you got to be kidding me. I'm blind. I couldn't see. How do I know where he's at? I didn't know anything till I was able to see. I don't know where he's at. Well, that's free. That's not in there, but it's, you know, just, where? <laughs> I mean, there's some humor there. Where is that man? That, he, I don't know. I don't know. Well, you see, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and these religious groups, but primarily those two, had at least one very important task. They were the keepers of, of orthodoxy. That means the basic beliefs of the faith. That's what orthodoxy is. And they would determine if you were following the rules and the regulations. So now we've got a guy. We got a guy that was blind. We got a guy that's blind from birth. A guy that's had some country preacher spit in the mud, put stuff on his eyes, send him down to one of the local pools and wash. And lo and behold, he could see. We're going to get to another important part. This happened on the Sabbath. You see, when you come to church, you have to do things a certain way. I mean, you even heard of making fun. You know, we got to quit this dancing up here. People think we're not Baptist because Baptists don't think you ought to dance or play cards or have mixed bathing. Any of y'all old enough to remember that? Mixed bathing. I, I, last time I talked to a young person, they said, what in the world is that? That was letting the guys and the girls swim at the same time. And then all this stuff about what you could and couldn't wear. I mean, y'all know rules and regulations. We create them. You know, the Methodists have a set. The Baptists have a set. The Presbyterians have a set. Uh, all you young millennials have a set. You know, we got all these rules and regulations. Well, uh, so they're going to take him to the 
folks who cover what's right and wrong. And so they brought him to the Pharisees and the man who had been blind was brought and says, now the day on which this happened, which Jesus made the mud and opened the eyes was the Sabbath. And so did he have a right to do that? Was that okay? Was, is this something that God would do? Does it meet? the test of all the rules and the regulations. So they're taking them to those who are the keepers of the rules and therefore the Pharisees also ask him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes. The man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Tells a story again. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God. If you were blind from birth and somebody put mud on your eyes and you washed it off and you could see, would you have a good or a bad feeling about this guy? I'd feel pretty good about it, wouldn't you? In fact, he's going to tell you why. He's not just making this up. And they said, this guy, he can't be from God. For he didn't keep the rules. He did this on the Sabbath. You're not supposed to do that. You can't pick up more than the weight of two figs. If you take your dentures out before sundown on Friday, you can't put them back in until after the Sabbath. I mean, they had some really strange... Go read them in the Mishnah and some of those other places and in the Talmuds and all the different commentaries. It's, it's hilarious. You'll find yourself laughing, but they were very serious about it. This man can't be from God because you are not allowed to do a work on the Sabbath. And so he's done this work. He's made this blind man able to see. And so they got him in question. But others asked, how can a sinner... Perform such signs because you see, if a person does something that only God can do, then certainly can't be a sinner because only God can forgive sins. And since the guy's a sinner because he was blind, only God can make him see. Y'all got to get this stuff straightened out. That can't be. Well, so they were divided. <laughs> Amazing, just like us today. And then they turned again to the blind man. What have you got to say about this guy? Which he has not what? Seen. <laughs> what have you got to say about it? Well, you know, I started to do my children's moment this morning with some, do you know some phrases? And then I decided that was against better judgment. Because you just don't know what you're going to get. Well, they were not ready for what they were about to get. And they said, what do you have to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. And the man replied, <laughs> he's a prophet. That was not what they wanted to hear. This is a man bringing us a word from God. Only God could do what was done. And they still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight. Why were they wrestling with that particular issue? Because only God could do what's been done to this man. So it has to be something else. You've got your story wrong. That can't be what happened. You ever had people push you in order to serve their own orthodoxy? Oh, yeah. Have you ever done that? Probably. And so he goes on. He says, is this your son? What did they do? They didn't get the right answer from the crowd. They didn't get the right answer from the man. So they go to his parents. Is this your son? They ask. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? Now, there's something else you need to know. When the term son of man is used, that is a synonym for Messiah. And the son of man as has been understood in the story is the one who's given the sight which makes him the Christ and anybody who claimed that Jesus was the Messiah was going to be put out of the synagogue. He was going to or she was going to be excommunicated. Well, the center of social environment and interaction in the first century was the synagogue. So the parents, they don't want to get kicked out of church. You know, we've kicked people out of church before because they didn't agree with us, hadn't we? In fact, today, Baptists in our history, we called it churching people. Uh, there is a basis for church discipline, but it's usually not a very good one when it's based on tradition and not on biblical scripture. 
So here, they're asking the parents. We know he's our son, the parents answered. And we know he was born blind. <laughs> and here's the out. Notice what they do. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He's responsible for himself. You see them getting out of it? They don't want to be kicked out of church. So, but how he can see, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who already had to see or decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. And that was why the parents said, he is of age, ask him. Verse 24. A second time, they summoned the man. Now, here, here this is going to get... I hope you can find... You know, when, sometimes when we read the Bible, we, we think it doesn't have humor in it. But this is... This is irony and humor, all mixed up. Just, just watch this. A second time, they summons the man who had been blind. Now, they set him up. You ever had somebody ask you a question in such a way that if you don't answer them the way they want you to answer it, you're wrong? Watch this. Give God the glory, they tell then tell me the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. <laughs> In other words, if you disagree with us, you're wrong. Now, give God the glory. Tell the truth. This man is a sinner. That's what we want you to say. But they're not gonna, he's not going to do this. Notice what he said. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, and by the way, this is the one and only thing. Remember the song? This is the one and only thing you do need to know. And he says, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, and now I can see. Friend, has the darkness of your life been transformed into the light of our Lord? Can you see? Can you see no matter where you're at? no matter who confronts you, no matter what they think or say about you, can you see? They ask him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? What, you know, you've asked me this twice already. What is wrong with you? I mean, it, get into the doubt. He comes, he says, he answered. I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Here's the cut. <laughs> Do you want to become his disciple too? <laughs> you want to become his disciple too? And then they hurled insults at him. He didn't answer right and said, you are this fellow's disciple. This is all a lie. You've made this up. You're just doing this to make him look good. You could say it in a lot of different ways. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we didn't even know where he came from. Again, the man answered. Now, that's remarkable. <laughs> you don't know. You're the keeper of orthodoxy. You're supposed to know God and everything about God. And you don't know. You don't know where he came from yet. He opened my eyes, and we know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will, which means he listened to this guy because he opened my eyes, and he's not listening to you. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God... He could do nothing. Wow. To this, they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. We're going to believe what we're going to believe. I don't care what evidence you put in front of me. We're going to believe it. And you, we're just going to get rid of it. And what does it say? They took him and they cast him out. 
Now that's the narrative around the story. The guy has had mud put on his eyes. The guy has washed the mud as he was commanded from his eyes. The guy can see, but he's only healed physically. He's not healed spiritually. And so there's two dynamics, not just the physical, but the spiritual. We move into spiritual blindness in the next verse. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, that means Jesus went and looked for them, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Do you believe in the Messiah? Do you believe what the Bible says? And primarily there and only there, he's talking about what the Old Testament, that's all they've got. Do you believe what it says about who he is and what he'll do when he comes? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. And Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Wow. The man said, Lord, I believe. Salvation is not secondary, it's primary. Great things can be done, but until you open your heart and you put your faith and trust in God, you can be a blind person lost or a seeing person lost. And so Jesus now has dealt with spiritual blindness in this man. He's put his faith and trust in the Messiah. He believes in the prophecy and the fact that Jesus is that Christ. And he begins to worship him. And Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into the world. Now, it's interesting. If you look over, just put your finger there and go with me over to John 3.16 for just a minute and look at what is said there about this same subject matter. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, and whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the God's one and only Son. And then notice verse 19. This is the what? The verdict. That is what is going to be pronounced as a judgment. This is the verdict. He says, light. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world but people of darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light. I don't care what proof you put in front of me. I don't care how much evidence you lay in front of me. I'm going to believe what I want to believe regardless. And that's exactly what they did. And the verdict is, if you don't have the light, you're lost. So what does he say back in our text? Let's go back to the text and see what he says about spiritual blindness. One guy received physical seeing, and now he's got spiritual seeing. And some of the Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and ask, What? Are we blind too? And Jesus said, If you were blind you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, you are guilty. And that guilt remains. Jesus came so that blind people could be made to see. And people who think that they see become blind all this stuff gets in the way. You see, there was a miracle. And the miracle was the revelation of God when he sent Jesus into the world. And Jesus is what? The light of the world. But there is an adjudication issue. There is a judgment if light is in your presence and you refuse the light and choose the darkness. It's a form of formal judgment on dispute. We have a physical piece of this story. We have a man born blind. 
We have a blessing that comes to him. An opportunity is offered. Mud is put in his eyes. He's commanded to go and wash. And he chooses to do that. He goes, he washes, he can see. And now this man born blind who now has followed receives blessing from the Lord. And in the blessing, he is free of his blindness. He can see. But the spiritual side of it is this. No matter how well the guy could see, and I've got to believe if Jesus healed him, he had at least 20-20 vision, don't you? But he surely had some spiritual vision because when he's asked, who is this Christ, this deliverer, this one that I have hoped in and I believed in, I want to find him, I need to see him. And he says, the one that's standing in front of you is that person. And he says, Lord, I believe, and he begins to worship. Now, his blindness is healed both on the physical and the spiritual side, but those who see what everything they believed and taught, what Bible and Scripture says is plain, and they turn from it to follow another truth in another direction, they are spiritually blind. And folks, I'm going to tell you today, if you don't follow God's word and you don't do all that it says, he doesn't give you a hand to go in there and do free crafting. If you don't do all that it says, then you are spiritually blind and you're still in your sin. And I know it may cost you something to stand up. I know it may cost you something to take an issue and say, this is what God's word says. Because you're in classes where you have people that are in darkness. You have professors that are in darkness. You have co-workers that are in darkness. And they want you to give them some edge, some way to remain in their sin and their lostness. But it takes real gumption to stand up. It may even get you kicked out when you stand up for Christ. Have you had that happen to you? I've had that happen to me. And it's not a fun place to be. But I tell you what, God always comes through. Amen. He always does what needs to be done that his light might be seen. So either you receive that salvation when the light comes and step out of darkness into the transforming power of God and receive light, or you stay lost in your sins. She had a difficult life. I mean, a very, very difficult life and. She was ostracized to say the least. She walked past one stream, a first well to a second well in the middle of the day. She's miserable. And everybody in her community felt it their place to help her to feel more miserable. And as she came to the well that day, she thought, it, well, that's just going to be another one of these days. Here's a guy, not just a guy, but a Jewish guy, and I'm a Samaritan. They hate us, and I know they don't like women, and they surely don't like women like me. And as she approached, he did something no rabbi, no male, no Jew would do, speak to a woman in public, much less a woman who was of mixed blood, a Samaritan. And she objects to him even speaking and asking for a drink of water. And Jesus responds, if you knew who it was that was asking you, you could ask him and he would give you living water. Well, she's in the physical and Jesus is doing what he does with all of us. He's trying to draw her from the physical into the spiritual. And they go through the dialogue, and she asks questions. And finally, you know, Jesus does what he does with all of us. He reaches out and he touches that deep, dark place in our heart with his light. He says, go call your husband. Ooh, can you imagine how that must have penetrated the heart of that lady? But she does what we do. We try to out. I don't have a husband. And Jesus, I think, because he does have that nature demonstrated in all of his ministry, he says, you've spoken the truth. You don't have a husband. You've been married five times, and the guy you're living with is not your husband. <laughs> you, you ever had that happen to you where somebody just put you in the examination room and there was no way to escape the light of the diagnosis? 
I perceive that you're a prophet. Interesting, both words, both stories. I perceive that you're a prophet. Where should we worship? Still trying to dodge the bullet. Still trying to get away from the responsibility. They say, we should worship on Mount Gerizim, and you say we should worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus is straight up. God's word is true and right, and salvation is of the Jews. But I want you to know something. That doesn't cut you out, hon. There's a day coming. There's a day coming when neither on this mountain or that, but people who worship will worship in spirit and truth. And she begins to break in her person and she says, I know, I know one day when the Messiah comes, he'll teach us all things. I who speak to you and me. Just like with the blind guy. It's me. It's between you and me. What you gonna do with this? The disciples come up and interrupt. I'm surprised at this point in my message somebody's cell phone hasn't gone off. Or somebody disrupted you that uh, God's speaking to and got up and had to go to the bathroom. He, he just does that stuff. And sure enough, just as she says this, the disciples walk up and she walks off and there's a dialogue with the disciples except we don't know till she gets over and it speaks a little bit later that she goes to the town and she says as she walks down the street, come and see the man who told me all that ever I did. Is this not the Christ? First class conditional sentence. This is the Lord's Messiah. And there is a revival that breaks out. And they say, we got to see this for ourselves. And they go and they listen. We believe because of you, but now we believe even more so because we've heard from him. I'm wondering if in the darkness of your life and in the darkness of mine this morning, we would hear from the light of the world. For you see, the most important thing that you and I have to decide before we leave this place is his light, our light. Do you know Jesus? Because he alone is the light of the world.